Good morning, everyone. This is Trent Norris at Arnold and Porter San Francisco office, and I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar on uh, health focused marketing and unappetizing litigation, latest trends in food labeling and advertising class actions. Uh, as most of you know, there has been uh, what some would consider a tidal wave of litigation uh, regarding uh, food products in the last couple of years. Um, literally dozens of cases have been filed uh, around the country in both state and federal court um, challenging a variety of claims made on food packaging. Uh, we wanted to update our uh, clients and participants uh, in today's webinar on the status of all of this litigation. Um, and uh, we thought that a WebEx would be the easiest way to do that. Um, there is a chat feature tool in WebEx uh, that some of you have used before. Please use that to ask questions throughout the program. We may have difficulty responding to all of your questions, but if your question is not answered, uh, by all means, please follow up with one of us. Um, the um, presentation should be appearing on your screen. If it's not, please press star zero and uh, the conference operator can assist you with that. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, there's an audio recording of it, and it may be posted on our website and otherwise used, uh, so it may be available to the public. Uh, we will, of course, not, in t not uh, identify the requesters uh, of the questions. Um, and for your convenience, shortly after the program, we'll send a link with the presentation materials uh, to the participants today. Um, today's presenters are uh, myself, my partner Angel Garganta and our colleagues Rhonda Stewart Goldstein and Jack Koenig. Angel and I have uh, presented a number of times on this very issue in the past, but today we actually have the brains of the operation with us uh, in the form of Rhonda and Jack uh, to talk about uh, more of the details uh, and get into it with you. Um, so without further ado, uh, Jack will first uh, uh, talk with us about what the plaintiffs are attacking in all of these cases. Jack? So as Trent said, to begin, we're going to take a look at the products and marketing claims that plaintiffs have been challenging lately. Um, as marketing has shifted to appeal to consumers' desire for healthier products, we've seen more and more plaintiffs filing suits over products that contain allegedly unhealthy ingredients. Most of these complaints cite product advertising that tends to suggest that the products are healthier wholesome. Plaintiffs have claimed that such advertising is misleading on the grounds that the products contain some allegedly unhealthy ingredient, such as trans fat, saturated fat, or high fructose corn syrup, even though the ingredient is listed on the product label. In other recent cases, plaintiffs have challenged overt marketing claims regarding specific health benefits. For example, vegetable spread that reduces cholesterol and milk with omega-3s that support brain health. These suits often allege that the manufacturer lacks sufficient clinical studies or other evidence to support the product claims. Other complaints in this area have challenged marketing claims that most would consider puffery, such as life-enhancing coconut water or a beverage with the ability to combat hangovers. Another common theme we've seen is plaintiffs challenging ingredient quality. For example, plaintiffs have challenged label claims of 100% pure Florida-squeezed orange juice and 100% pure coconut water as allegedly misleading. In these cases, plaintiffs often claim that the claims are misleading in light of the processing that the product undergoes. And of course, one of the most talked about recent trends, all natural claims. In these cases, plaintiffs take issue with the use of the word natural to describe products containing allegedly unnatural ingredients, including such common ingredients as baking powder and fruit extracts. In some instances, plaintiffs claim that processing renders an ingredient unnatural such as alkalized cocoa or ingredients that are genetically engineered. One notable recent development in the all-natural complaints is the allegation that unnatural ingredients are somehow harmful. We've seen this allegation in suits over products with genetically engineered ingredients. Finally, we have suits alleging that products are misbranded under state and federal law. The number of these suits has grown significantly in recent months due to the work of one group of plaintiff's lawyers who have filed suits against dozens of food companies. In these complaints, plaintiffs latch onto a purported violation of FDA regulations, often something highly technical, and proceed to attempt to transform it into a consumer protection claim. For example, these suits have challenged antioxidant claims, sugar-free claims, and other nutrient content claims. Now I'll pass it over to Angel to tell us who's behind this litigation. Thanks, Jack. Um, who's behind the litigation? Well, 
a lot of firms that you've heard of in the past and some that you haven't heard of. I, what's tended to happen over the past few years is, I, I like to call it the uh, greener pastures syndrome. And in general, I would say that as uh, other areas of class action litigation have dried up, uh, either through uh, statutory uh, reforms or, or judicial decisions, for example, limitations on securities cases, uh, much more prone now to being dismissed on the pleadings, uh, firms that were formerly in those areas have moved into the food area. Not coincidentally, because there has, as Jack mentioned, also been an increase in general on health-focused and, and other types of advertising of food. So uh, we've got a number of firms up on the screen, um, and they've each, uh, each of them has been quite active uh, in the area. Uh, and, and you have firms that used to do things like antitrust class actions, asbestos litigation, insurance, even medical device litigation, and they're all moving uh, into food. That, by the way, the same is true of defense firms. You know, we're, we're going into the food area and have been for the past several years where we used to litigate in other areas. So we thought we'd take you through some uh, litigation strategies in these types of cases. When If you get hit by one, how do you handle them? Uh, and at, at the risk of, uh, of giving away our ammunition to our plaintiff friends, uh, some of whom I guess are on the call, uh, let's talk about what you do, for example, when you get a pre-lawsuit demand, uh, which is the typical in California, the Consumer Legal Remedies Act demand letter, uh, their equivalents in Florida and New Jersey and other states. Uh, do you want to, you know, put your defense case in your response? That's normally due within 30 days of receipt of the demand. Uh, you know, when you think about that, you really have to think about what you're going to do with the case. If you're thinking of settling the case, then it makes sense to put a pretty robust statement of your case in the letter that you send back to plaintiff's counsel. Uh, if you're thinking that you're actually going to litigate the case, that you have a pretty good chance of, of beating the case uh, on a pleadings motion, uh, then you might hold back and keep your powder dry. In doing it, you also need to consider, uh, as you're responding to these demands, the risk of, of uh, regulator lawsuits from uh, FTC, from state AGs, uh, and, and other uh, enforcers. So uh, should you settle before the litigation? It's always a question that comes up when you get these demand letters. Increasingly, we've seen plaintiffs' firms suggest that uh, a private settlement is the way to go. Uh, in, in, and that often becomes a case where the product sales are not great and the cost of litigation uh, might actually, in some cases, even approach the sales of the product. Uh, so you have to engage in, in a, a, a cost-benefit analysis. Think about whether uh, you know it makes sense to settle this case privately on a non-class basis with the particular plaintiff making the demand. Are you likely to be able to keep the settlement confidential? Are there other uh, plaintiffs out there uh, trolling? Uh, no offense. Uh, for the same kind of claims. Um, is this somehow going to get out, uh, harm the reputation of your, your, your company or your product? Uh, and of course, you, you need to keep in mind that such a private settlement is not going to uh, give you race judicata effect, is, is not going to protect you from lawsuits by other plaintiffs. In doing all of this, naturally, you need to consider uh, your chances of success uh, down the road. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Rhonda, who's going to take us through uh, precisely 
the kinds of things that you need to consider about uh, in, in terms of whether you're going to succeed down the road. Great. So, assuming you haven't settled uh, prior to the prior to the complaint being filed, uh, the next question will be whether you want to move to dismiss the complaint or go ahead and file your answer. Uh, and a key consideration in determining whether you will move to dismiss depends in large part on the result that you think that you're likely to get. For example, if after evaluating the case, you think there's a good chance that the court will throw out the case entirely without granting the plaintiff leave to amend, then you likely will want to go ahead and file your motion. And if you think that you can narrow some of the claims or the theories that are alleged in the complaint, similarly, you may also decide that it makes sense to move to dismiss. However, if the chances are good that the court will simply give the plaintiff leave to amend, you may not want to file the motion, as that will simply give the plaintiff an opportunity to fix the errors in the complaint and possibly weaken the potential arguments that you could have brought on class certification or at the summary judgment stage. So looking at the potential grounds upon which you could bring a motion to dismiss, one is the uh, a motion to challenge the plaintiff's standing or lack thereof. And a key question when thinking about standing is whether the plaintiff has sufficiently alleged an injury from a defendant's marketing of the product. In these cases, plaintiffs often allege that they would not have purchased a product had they known that it contained a particular substance such as trans fat or lead or high fructose corn syrup. And the question is, will this be enough to state a claim if that substance in and of itself is not harmful in the product? Or will the court determine that the injury is too speculative? So in order to answer that question, let's step back and take a look at standing more generally. In federal court, plaintiffs must satisfy the requirements of Article III standing, which means that they must demonstrate a case or controversy between the parties. The key part of that is showing a concrete and particularized injury that the court can address. In addition, the plaintiff will also be required to satisfy the particular standing requirements of the state consumer protection law under which they sue. And the requirements of those, stat those statutes vary from state to state. However, some of the relevant questions under those statutes involve whether the plaintiff actually relied on the statement at issue, whether that reliance was reasonable, and whether the statement actually caused the plaintiff to purchase the product. And circling back to the initial question we began with, a key consideration when bringing a uh, motion to dismiss is whether the plaintiff actually suffered an injury and whether that injury is sufficient to confer standing. We'll take a look at a few cases that deal specifically with this issue. One of the key cases that demonstrates the types of theories of injuries that plaintiff allege is Enri Fruit Juice Marketing uh, Products Marketing, a case out of uh, Massachusetts Federal Court. In this case, the plaintiff challenged the advertising of fruit juices that contained levels at lead, of lead at which the FDA had already determined were safe for human consumption. And the plaintiff's theories were grounded on two particular uh, theories. The first was that the products posed a health risk because the plaintiffs were at future risk of harm from lead poisoning. The second was an economic injury alleged, and the uh, plaintiffs claimed that they would not have brought the products if they knew that they had contained lead. And these are two of the key theories that we're seeing uh, in these cases. Regarding the health risk, the court determined that that risk was too hypothetical and rejected it as a potential ground for standing. The court held that the plaintiffs failed to show a credible or substantial th threat to their health, uh, essentially importing a product liability standard, and determined that the plaintiffs had not alleged that there was a specific amount of lead actually in the product, the level at which lead would be dangerous, and they also could not demonstrate that anyone had suffered any actual injury, which was substantiated by the FDA's whole prior holding that the levels were, were in fact safe. As a result, the court concluded that the risk of future harm was too speculative to constitute an injury in fact. The plaintiffs also alleged an economic theory of injury, which the court also rejected, relying largely on the fact that the products had been determined to be safe by FDA. As a result, the products were not valueless, as the plaintiffs claim, or unsuitable for human consumption. The court held that the plaintiffs got the benefit of their bargain. They paid for fruit juice, and that is what they got, with no harm to themselves. As a result, the court concluded that the plaintiffs did not have standing. However, we do see cases that hold 
the opposite. So it's a very risky area of law. For example, in the Askin versus Quaker Oats case, which involved uh, granola bars and uh, allegations that the, plaint that the plaintiff made that the bars had trans fats in them, the court declined to analyze standing based on the future health concern, although the plaintiff claimed that he would not have purchased them had he known of the alleged health risks. In this case, the court focused not necessarily on the health risk, but the economic injury that the plaintiff alleged. And in this case, the court held that the economic injury was enough. The plaintiff alleged that he would not have purchased the products and that he paid more for them than he would have had he known that they contained trans fat, even though it was less than 0.5 grams of trans fat. The plaintiff uh, alleged that he wanted to avoid trans fats, and the court found that this was enough, even if it wasn't, the trans fats were not harmful. So the court held that the price differential represents a concrete injury, in fact, even though there was no physical harm from the product. And this just demonstrates that courts have held both ways on these issues. So it may not be enough to allege that the plaintiff simply purchased the product and paid money for it. The court could come out either way on that claim. No, a couple of other potential grounds for bringing a motion to dismiss is that the plaintiffs have failed to state a plausible claim or to state that claim with particularity. And these requirements tee off of the federal rules of civil procedure, in particular, rule eight, which uh, typically has required only notice pleading or a short, concise statement of the claim to put defendant on notice of the allegations. And prior to a couple of recent Supreme Court rulings in Iqbal and Twombly, that only required that the claim that the complaint state a conceivable theory of liability. However, in these cases, the Supreme Court elevated that to a plausibility standard, meaning that it's not enough to simply recite legal conclusions, but the plaintiff must plead facts allowing a reasonable inference that the defendant acted unlawfully. Similarly, under Rule 9b, plaintiff must state fraud, state fraud with particularity. And the state consumer protection laws courts have held sound in fraud, hence these requirements will apply. As a result, the complaint must state the who, what, when, where, and how of the misconduct charged. A recent case that illustrates this point is Henry Wesson Oil, which came out of the Central District of California. In that case, the plaintiff alleged that cooking oil, Wesson cooking oil, was not 100% natural due to the presence of genetically modified organisms. In that case, the court kicked out the case um, with leave to amend, however, holding that the plaintiff had not adequately alleged how he saw the representations, how often he was exposed, how often he purchased the product, and when. As a result, it did not afford the defendant an adequate opportunity to respond to the complaint. The takeaway from this point is that although these grounds may be uh, viable for a motion to dismiss, you run the risk that the plaintiff will simply get leave to amend the complaint. Now I'll turn it back to Jack for preemption. Thanks, Rhonda. <clears throat> preemption can be a strong defense when a plaintiff seeks to impose a labeling requirement that is different from federal labeling requirements. In the food context, the defense tends to be successful only when there is an existing federal regulation governing, governing the specific labeling statement at issue. This slide lists a few examples of cases in which defendants successfully asserted a preemption defense to defeat some or all claims. In Turek, Judge Posner reason, recently concluded that federal law preempted a plaintiff's claim alleging that the marketing of fiber bars was misleading and that the bars did not disclose that the fiber came from chicory root. Posner concluded that the plaintiff's claim was preempted because FDA regulations set requirements for the labeling of dietary fiber, and those requirements do not include a disclosure of the source of fiber. Similarly, in the Wesson case, the court dismissed a portion of the complaint demanding that ConAgra provide a disclosure of genetically engineered ingredients in Wesson oil. Because the FDA has thoroughly regulated the manner in which ingredients must be listed, and identification of genetically engineered ingredients is not required, plaintiff was attempting to impose a requirement not identical to federal law. Therefore, the court concluded that plaintiff's demand was preempted. Kraft also successfully asserted a preemption defense to win dismissal of claims challenging percent fat-free statements on its deli meats. Kraft's label statements complied with USDA regulations, which, express, which expressly govern when a product can make a percent fat-free claim. 
the product labels had also been approved by the USDA. Thus, the court concluded that any state law claim based on the contention that the labels are false or misleading was preempted by both the regulation and the label approval process. While the foregoing cases show effective preemption defenses, it is important to understand the limitations of the defense. Remember that preemption tends to be successful only when plaintiff's claim is based on a labeling statement or omission in an area governed by an existing federal law. Generally, federal policy is not enough. So, for example, we've seen courts hold that claims over an all-natural statement are not preempted because the FDA has consistently refused to define the term natural in regulations, even though the agency has provided a definition in a non-binding policy statement. The seminal case on this point is Holt v. Snapple. We've also listed the Wesson Oil case here again to demonstrate the limitations of the preemption defense. As we saw in the last slide, plaintiff could not require ConAgra to describe an ingredient as from a genetically engineered source because FDA thoroughly regulates ingredient labeling. However, the court allowed plaintiff's challenge to the Wesson all-natural statement to stand because FDA has not regulated the use of the term natural. More recently, we've seen defendants argue that claims based on alleged violations of FDA regulation should be preempted because the FDCA expressly preempts private enforcement. A number of courts have rejected this argument where a complaint cites to a state law that is uh, identical to federal labeling requirements, as in Dela Cruz v. Cytosport. Most federal food regulations permit identical state laws, thus plaintiffs have avoided the ban on private enforcement by bringing claims based on these identical state laws. Plaintiffs are likely to make these arguments in California because of the California Supreme Court decision in the farm-raised salmon cases, holding that the FDCA does not preempt private enforcement of identical state laws, such as California's Sherman Law. <clears throat> One promising trend we have seen lately is limited preemption of certain natural claims that are made in conjunction with another, with another labeling statement that is governed by federal law. For example, in Harrison v. South Beach, a federal judge in California recently dismissed with prejudice a suit challenging labeling statements on Sobe Life water beverages. The plaintiff had challenged an all-natural with vitamins claim, fruit names used to describe the product's flavoring, and the description of the vitamins by their common names. Because the vitamin claims and the fruit claims were regulated by FDA, the court held that the private claims were preempted. The court went one step further to rule that plaintiff's challenge of the all-natural statement alone was no longer viable because the claim would rest on a single out-of-context phrase in one part of the label. Another recent decision demonstrates the distinction between the types of natural claims that are likely to be preempted and those that are not. In Ostiana v. Dryers, the court ruled that an all-natural flavors claim was preempted by federal regulations governing artificial flavorings while a more general all-natural claim was not preempted because no federal regulation governs the use of the term natural. So as these cases demonstrate, in some senses, it is actually better to be subject to more federal regulation as compliance with federal regulations can be used as a shield against consumer suits. Jack, uh, let me ask you a question about preemption. What impact do you think the FDA's emphasis, uh, the commissioner's recent emphasis in, on front of package labeling and stressing non-misleading front of package labeling have on the preemption defense? On how that's, that's an interesting question. Unfortunately, I think the answer is that it's not particularly helpful for defendants asserting a preemption defense, and it may in fact be harmful the reason is that uh, a simple policy statement, like the FDA commissioner's open letter to industry um, on, on food labeling, is not a binding regulation, and therefore it's not subject or it's not likely to preempt a consumer claim. What it will do, however, is give plaintiffs some material to show that the FDA thinks that a particular labeling statement is misleading, and that therefore the court should too. Uh, the trouble is where FDA has not set out a clear regulation that industry can conform to. Uh, compliance with FDA policy can be sort of a moving target, uh, and there's kind of a reduced incentive to adhere to such policies when doing so doesn't guarantee protection from consumer claims. And another example of that, I guess, is the all-natural policy, the FDA's informal all-natural That's right. policy. That's right, and as we just saw, a number of courts have, have held that that won't be given preemptive effect. Okay. So why don't you tell us about primary jurisdiction? Sure. Uh, 
related to preemption is the doctrine of primary jurisdiction. And pursuant to this doctrine, courts may, under appropriate circumstances, stay or dismiss a case on the grounds that the initial decision-making responsibility should be performed by the relevant agency rather than the courts. The doctrine applies whenever enforcement of the claim requires the resolution of issues which, under a regulatory scheme, have been placed within the special competence of an administrative body. Although the FDA has extensively regulated food labeling, courts faced with state law challenges in the food labeling area have concluded that they are well-equipped to handle the question of whether product marketing could mislead a reasonable consumer. So for the primary jurisdiction doctrine to apply in the food labeling context, there generally must be some pending unresolved question that requires agency expertise. Where the agency at issue has declined to provide guidance, for example, the FDA's refusal to define the word natural, the doctrine is less likely to apply. And now I'll turn it back to Angel, who will tell us about prior substantiation claims. This is an interesting area, which has just recently gained a lot of prominence in the courts, particularly in California, but there's also been some decisions in New Jersey. And some of the claims that are made, particularly health benefit claims for food, are claims that have been challenged by plaintiffs for lacking substantiation. Now, particularly not only in the food, but also in the supplement area, a number of courts have held that there is no private right of action under the state consumer protection laws to challenge claims as false or misleading merely because they are unsubstantiated. A recent case on that is Chavez v. Nestle, which is now up on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. That case relied on a number of prior cases, including a fairly sleepy and not often noticed California State of Appeal case called Kin Pharma that had held that alleging mere lack of substantiation was not sufficient. So what's happening now is that in response to these cases, and there's another one, the one I mentioned in New Jersey is called Franulovic v. Coca-Cola. It's a Third Circuit opinion. The plaintiffs have begun to try to buttress their complaints, the ones that allege lack of substantiation for benefit claims, by adding, we've actually seen some plaintiffs attach purported expert reports to their complaints. And, you know, like some of these expert reports, I would hardly dignify with the word report. But anyway, they attach these and they say, I have reviewed the claims and these claims are not substantiated. They're false or misleading because of this, that, or the other thing. And they're hoping with that to get past the pleading hurdle. So it's an interesting development. Another development in food cases that is, I think, promising, although it's certainly not going to dispose of cases entirely, is that several courts have dismissed Magnuson Moss warranty claims on the ground that food claims are merely product descriptions that didn't constitute warranties. So if you look at the Magnuson Moss Act, what it says is that you warrant that a product is defect free or will meet a specified performance level over a specified period of time. That's what the statute says, 15 U.S.C. 2301. The courts looking in particular at all natural claims have said, wait a minute, it's not defective for a product to be, quote unquote, synthetic or artificial, supposedly non-natural. In fact, supposedly the allegedly synthetic ingredients were added purposely, not accidentally. So it's not a defect. It's an intentional component of the product. And there's no 
specified performance over a specified period of time. So on those grounds, uh, quite a few of these uh, breach of warranty claims have been dismissed. Uh, Trent's going to talk to us now about summary judgment. So um, uh, assuming that you've uh, gotten through the pleading stage of the case and you've tried Iqbal and Twombly and you've tried preemption and you've tried primary jurisdiction um, and uh, you've been able to perhaps narrow the claims by knocking out uh, a couple of items that the court has considered preempted, um, assuming that there are still some claims that remain, uh, you often face then a strategic question. Um, it used to be that class certification was the next stage of the case, and in a sort of paint-by-numbers approach uh, to litigation, that's exactly where you would go, as we were all taught in civil procedure class. Um, but lately, there has been a real trend towards bringing motions on the merits, summary judgment motions, and accelerating them uh, ahead of class cert or simultaneously with class cert. This is driven in part by uh, a recognition by many judges and uh, a, trend that I, a trend that I would say is, uh, is overwhelming now, uh, realizing that bifurcating discovery as between class certification issues and merits issues um, is fraught with difficulty. It becomes um, hard for the court to draw a clean line uh, between those two areas. Um, and although uh, defendants typically want real limits on discovery, um, and the hope is that, uh, for instance, by putting classification first, you would limit discovery to a more narrow set of issues. It often involves um, very similar uh, numbers of witnesses, very similar documents, um, and rather than go through everything twice, it can indeed be more efficient uh, to just do a discovery phase of the case uh, all, uh, can set all, all together in, at one time rather than drawing a line between them. Um, and that's prompted, of course, many clients to say, well, if we're going to have full discovery on the merits, why don't we bring motions on the merits as well? In addition, the legal issues uh, of class certification and the merits have become quite intertwined. Um, if you think about it, depending on your vantage point, um, you know, issues of, uh, of standing and lack of injury also go to many of the elements uh, necessary for class certification around the lines of, for instance, commonality. Um, and so, the, uh, so there are often real synergies in making these motions simultaneously or even putting the merits motion ahead of the, of the uh, class certification motion. Um, the, uh, and the other part of it is that there are many of these cases in which the merits are quite strong um, but which uh, the class certification arguments uh, from the defense perspective are relatively weak. Um, uh, it's a product that uh, perhaps has been marketed quite, wi quite widely um, on very similar terms to similar people. Um, you know, there are lots of arguments about people perceiving claims uh, differently. Uh, there are courts who will uh, glide right past those issues, however, and go ahead with, um, with a certification. And uh, so you have to stop and think, you know, if we're going to do certification first, um, what will happen um, if the case is certified? There will be some publicity around that often. Um, there is some expense, perhaps, of notice uh, to consumers. Um, that can be shifted to the plaintiffs, um, but it's highly discretionary. Um, and uh, there's not a solid trend on those issues in the courts. Um, and the risk of the case goes way up, um, and business people start to perceive the risk differently after a class is certified. This is why plaintiffs, of course, would like the class to be certified first, because the settlement value of the case goes way up at that point. Um, so uh, if that is the situation uh, that you feel your uh, business would be in, then it's often a good idea to go ahead and accelerate the merit side of the case at the same time and move for summary judgment. Now, uh, we've listed here a few examples of uh, matters in which uh, these have gone out of the ordinary um, uh, uh, scheme of things. And I would just highlight, uh, for instance, the Applebee's menu labeling litigation in which there were multiple cases around the country pending in state and federal courts 
uh, they could not be brought together in, in one place. And nevertheless, the merits issues uh, we felt were quite strong. Um, it was possible in that case to uh, line the uh, various matters up like dominoes, uh, and the hope was that a win on the merits in, uh, in one would be viewed favorably by the next judge to, uh, to consider the issue uh, and down the line. Now, with summary judgment, of course, you face all the issues you always face in summary judgment of issues of material fact uh, being raised and attempts to prevent uh, summary judgment from being granted on those grounds. Um, a dispute of experts uh, between each other, uh, all of those sorts of things. Nevertheless, in an appropriate case, uh, this is a strategy that, uh, that we believe can be quite effective in countering uh, the claims of the plaintiffs here. Um, so to talk about class certification then, uh, we'll move back to Angel. Let, let me just, uh, one comment and a question mm -hmm. on the, the summary judgment before class cert strategy. The, this is a strategy that, is, as Trent said, we, we have pursued successfully uh, in the Applebee's cases. There is a risk that comes with it, of course, which is you move for summary judgment, your summary judgment is only against the named plaintiffs, which in general will discourage all others because it is, I mean, if it's not race judicata, it's at least going to be stare decisis. You'll have good opinions on point. The downside is you'd better have a really strong case like we did in Applebee's uh, because if you don't, uh, the loss is going to be binding on you too. And then you're, you, you know, that's obviously going to be a problem if a class is certified down the road. So with that, let's talk a little bit about class certification. And uh, of course, everybody's heard of Dukes versus Walmart. Uh, and the uh, so-called sea change that it has achieved in the law of class certification. In particular, it's beefing up of the commonality requirement uh, under Rule 23. Um, and so the question is, given Dukes and the lower court's application of Dukes, how can defendants use that uh, in food cases. Uh, just a couple of key statements from Dukes to remind you of what it stands for, uh, that plaintiffs must demonstrate that their claims depend on a common contention that is capable of class-wide resolution. And what the court really means by that is that you need to be able to resolve a central issue in one stroke, or as it put it, it put it in a different way, that there must be not only common questions, but questions that will generate common answers. Uh, and the court also imposed <clears throat> a higher standard of actually coming forward with facts at the class certification stage. In fact, continuing that trend, there's now a case up on, uh, the, the, the court has granted uh, cert in a Comcast case that involves damages and what showing needs to be made with respect to damages at the class certification stage. Look out for that case because my prediction is it's going to continue the trend that we saw in Dukes. So with application to food cases, what does Dukes mean for food cases? And I would suggest that you're going to have the strongest uh, opposition to class certification in food cases when you're talking about a, a, a complaint that challenges claims about several aspects of a product, differently worded claims, variation in advertising or prominence of claims over time, uh, different products involved, uh, characteristics of the product varied over time. So in a way, you know, the, the, your creative marketing department that's wanting to change the packaging uh, every season is good on class certification. Uh, the, the strategy is, and we have used it successfully in, in, a, in some cases and seen others do it, is to come forward with a declaration that's just loaded with different packaging and and 
if the def if the plaintiffs actually focus their complaints as they often do on the entire line of a, a manufacturer's products that have a particular ingredient or make a particular type of claim, then that's actually good for you on class cert. It, it's an interesting phenomenon that sometimes plaintiffs in the race to the courthouse can't resist having their, you know, their representative plaintiff who may have bought one product try to sue on every product. Uh, and that also, of course, creates standing and typicality issues on class cert. Uh, here's a couple of examples of a, a defendant win on this issue and a plaintiff win. In the Red versus Kraft case, which was before Judge Wu down in the Central District, and it, anybody who's appeared before Judge Wu knows that he is very careful on class cert and goes through the record uh, minutely. Um, this case involved six different products. And ultimately, it went through a bunch of rounds. The plaintiffs tried to amend their, their class cert motion by alleging subclasses as to each product. But in the end, the, the court denied class certification with prejudice on, on an interesting issue, which was damages. And as it says here, the proof of what purchases were made of what products, where and when, in order to determine class member damages is simply too individualized. On the other side, in the Johnson versus uh, General Mills case, which involved uh, Yo Plus uh, yogurt and the, al the general allegation that Yo Plus prom promotes uh, digestive health, in a way that ordinary yogurt does not, um, the court said that the, the alleged injury uh, stemmed from a common core of facts because that campaign, that digestive health campaign, had little or no variation. Uh, there was a persistent and a material message, and so the court certified the class. Um, let me mention another point, uh, a, a very, I think, very significant recent development particularly in the Ninth Circuit, but also in other circuits, we're seeing it as well, is the, <clears throat> the increasing tendency of uh, courts to certify nationwide classes on the ground that there are simply too many variances in state laws, state consumer protection laws, uh, which result in a lack of common issues and a lack of predominance. And this is the type of case where a plaintiff will file suit under the law of one state, say California, and wants to apply it uh, to the entire nation. Um, the, the court, in the Ninth Circuit in Maza, this is not a food case, but it has been followed in some food cases, uh, held that uh, you simply couldn't do that. And moreover, in that particular case, uh, and this does resonate in the food context, the class would also include members who weren't exposed to the message or wouldn't have relied on the particular message challenged. And again, that is quite helpful where you have a lot of different variation in packaging and advertising over time. Um, as I said, the Maza has been followed in a couple of food cases that I, we have here and more than a couple, but recent decision by Judge Carter uh, down in the uh, Central District of California in Orange County, um, declined to uh, follow Maza and decertify a class, a national class that had been uh, certified under California law uh, on the ground that uh, you really have to look at the circumstances of the particular case. And given the particular issues in that case, uh, the, the defendants had not come forward with sufficient evidence that there were conflicts in the state's various state laws to preclude a nationwide class. Uh, so if you're a defendant and you, you want to hit a nationwide class hard, you'd better do your homework and come forward with the actual, you know, what are the material differences between, say, California and New York law or California, Massachusetts, or whatever states you might find some differences in. Um, all right. So let's say 
you know, you don't, you, you defeat class certification while the case is over, but what if you lose it, or what if you think you're going to lose it? Then uh, one question, and you're not going to be able to get summary judgment along the lines that Trent mentioned, uh, how do you settle a case? And uh, that's what it comes down to, uh, dollars. Uh, how do you satisfy the plaintiffs and their counsel and move on? Um, and what do you have to think about in crafting a settlement, in working up a settlement that is not only going to be approved, uh, but you know that's not going to later be reversed on appeal, which we're seeing increasingly now. Uh, various considerations. Should it be nationwide or should it be statewide? And the Maza case, among others, has recently been creating some problems for nationwide settlements, although a number of courts have distinguished it as a litigation case and not one that should preclude uh, nationwide settlement classes, which I think is, is the correct approach. Is the relief to the class adequate? Uh, are the attorney's fees appropriate? Uh, is your settlement going to whet the appetites of not so much the FTC, but possibly some of the state, the state AGs who may already be looking at the issue? A um, couple of examples here uh, in the food area. Here's a settlement that was recently approved in the Southern District of California, and it was a uh, in the Nutella litigation, uh, which basically challenged the claim that uh, Nutella is part of a nutritious breakfast. And what Nutella meant was that, you know, if you use the spread, you'll get your kids to eat other good stuff. And the plaintiff said, well, this is loaded with sugar. How can that be nutritious? Um, they did not get, in this particular California case, they didn't get a nationwide class certified, but they did have a, a California class certified. And there was also a companion case in New Jersey, which is uh, not mentioned here, uh, where there was a larger... Uh, settlement, but it, that hasn't yet been approved. So what's interesting about this case is the court uh, preliminarily approved a settlement that's awarding over a million dollars in attorney's fees and costs, while the fund that the class gets is only $550,000. So there's a little bit of a, a disjunction here. Uh, and it remains to be seen what's going to happen with that settlement down the line. Uh, the, the New Jersey settlement has a similar uh, dynamic. I say this in particular in light of the Ninth Circuit's uh, recent opinion a couple of weeks ago in the Kellogg case, uh, which essentially set aside a $10.6 million class settlement uh, involving the marketing of Kellogg's cereals as being healthy or nutritious. And the Ninth Circuit uh, rejected two things. One was the Cypre charity, which was, well, there wasn't a specific Cypre recipient identified to begin with. What there was, was a, an agreement to distribute food to charities that feed the needy and subject to later identification and approval by the, the district court. The Ninth Circuit did not like that and stressed in, in very strongly, and this is actually a, a, a disturbing new development, that the correct Cypre charity needs to be, uh, and I quote, not charities that feed the needy, or in other words, not charities that have some relation to the factual issue or you know the, the, the case involving food, for instance, but rather organizations, get this, dedicated to protecting consumers from or redressing injuries caused by false advertising. So the Ninth Circuit's definition of a side prey in a false advertising case is now after this case, a 
pro-consumer advocacy organization. Wouldn't you just love to donate money to those guys? Uh, I say this to our clients, not necessarily to some of the other folks on the call. Um, the court, and here's, a, here's something the plaintiffs aren't going to like, the court also held that the settlement was no good because the $2 million award of attorney's fees, which represented 19% of the overall settlement value, below the 25% benchmark that the Ninth Circuit normally applies, was excessive since the settlement would only provide $2.75 million to cover consumer claims. So it, it looked at the Lodestar and said, these guys are getting $2,100 an hour, uh, and we don't care how good they were, they're not getting this. So look out for settlements. This continues a trend that the Ninth Circuit started uh, in with the Bluetooth case that came out about uh, eight months ago, uh, and you got to be really careful settling cases. So Trent's now going to wrap it up. So uh, I sent a note out. We're nearing the end of the formal presentation, so if you have questions, please send them in via the web chat feature. Um, the takeaway points here, um, we have uh, four major areas uh, to address. One is obviously the importance of matching your marketing claims to what your research and development folks tell you about the product. When you're making any sort of factual claim uh, for the product, it may look like puffery to you, and you may have, in fact, an argument that it's puffery. Uh, but the literal connotation of the claim will often be read by a court um, as uh, being something that's very important, particularly on a motion to dismiss or some other motion that does not refer to, to factual issues. Um, obviously, a very important part of it. Um, conforming your labeling and your advertising to FDA regulations as well as FDA policy guidance uh, is obviously very important as well. Um, it avoids claims that are based on misbranding theories uh, and those sorts of things uh, from uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, but even more importantly, if you remember nothing from this presentation today, it's to keep in mind that there are other cops on the beat besides the FDA. Um, there is a, uh, a, a relentless and understandable focus on what the Food and Drug Administration thinks about claims on uh, food products and other uh, products that FDA regulates. Uh, but they are not the sole arbiter of whether uh, these claims are indeed legal or whether individuals have been uh, defrauded uh, based on the claims. Um, it is very important to think beyond FDA. FDA has a lot of other priorities. Um, food is not their highest uh, for the most part. Um, they also, uh, and, and so their enforcement uh, is uh, not particularly consistent. They have lots of informal guidance that they have issued in the form of warning letters, in the form of informal policies. These are not necessarily helpful to industry um, and often are used against uh, uh, defendants in these cases, as Angel mentioned earlier. Um, the uh, preemptive effect of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and, uh, and of FDA's uh, prior actions is uh, more limited than it is often believed uh, by food companies. Um, and the courts have increasingly whittled away from that in looking very closely at the details looking at uh, conflict preemption uh, and looking at express preemption. Um, and in very rare circumstances have we ever seen FDA reach out and say something helpful uh, to a food company that finds itself in a, a lawsuit. They typically want nothing to do with it. Um, and then even more importantly, there are entire areas in which there is no FDA regulation as a practical matter. Uh, the term natural being a very good example of that. Um, and it's a very fact-based determination as to what it means to be natural. One of the questions uh, that we've received so far um, asks whether there's any guidance uh, on using the word natural uh, on product labeling. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, it is clearly a flag for litigation. Um, the plaintiff's lawyers uh, need to do nothing than go to their local supermarket, 
and walk down the aisle and identify the products with the word natural on them and uh, identify some plausible disconnect between that term and, for instance, the ingredient list or the way in which the product uh, surely must have been processed um, in order for them to uh, make out a plausible claim. And that claim may indeed survive a motion to dismiss, um, which puts you into uh, expensive litigation in discovery and, and the like. Um, so the, the term natural, um, I think uh, the best advice we can give is to ask your uh, marketing folks and your business people um, how worthwhile that term really is. Do they really believe uh, that it's going to sell more product, uh, lead to more share, give you more shelf space with your retailers, and those sorts of things? Um, a very common dynamic in these cases, and I'm sure many on the call have experienced this as well, is uh, the marketing department will, uh, will, will fight the legal department in order to get a claim on the label. Um, and then once the lawsuit begins, uh, the marketing department's nowhere to be found in terms of how important that particular claim is to sales of the product um, and uh, often willing to give it up or modify it in a way that uh, the legal department may have advised them earlier. So if nothing else, perhaps this, uh, this parade of cases um, may provide legal departments with some uh, ammunition in those uh, conversations and the, the natural tension that occurs between the marketers and the, uh, and the lawyers. Um, the third uh, issue here, Angel has mentioned already, the, var the variance in advertising and labeling increases the difficulty for the plaintiffs to achieve um, uh, class certification and also to plead their complaint with particularity, also to find indeed representative plaintiffs that uh, represent each of the variations, the, the, or I guess I would say the material variations in the packaging um, that, uh, that your product may represent over a long period of time. Um, this is not a strategy we've seen people pursue from the beginning, but it certainly is something that recognizes the way these products tend to be marketed and, uh, and can use it in defense of, of the cases. And then finally, um, it's very important uh, in these cases to litigate them strategically. There can be a great deal at risk uh, in these cases uh, monetarily, um, that amount um, can increase through the course of the litigation. And so uh, it is critical to consider very early on in the case um, what is the overall uh, strength of uh, your defenses, uh, what are the um, options that you have to actually uh, defend against yourself, what's the likelihood that you'll succeed in some of these, where is this case headed, how important uh, are these claims to you? Uh, and the reason is that um, every dollar you spend, there's a, there's a meter running, of course, on the plaintiff's side of the case. And uh, the plaintiff's counsel, in particular, are going to expect to be compensated uh, for their effort in the case. So um, the, the time to think about the merits of the case is right at the outset, uh, and not to uh, blithely go down the path of litigating uh, a variety of options um, before you really uh, get the business people, for instance, to focus on the case and, and where it's going. Another reason for this is the, the trend that we've discussed here of courts being extraordinarily skeptical of settlements in these cases. Um, oftentimes, if you've litigated a case for a matter of, of years um, with a great deal of discovery, uh, et cetera, uh, you do not want to settle it on terms that uh, do not allow for race judicata. So you do want court approval ultimately of your settlement. And in many cases, you, you need to have it. The case cannot be dismissed without that. Uh, and so the, uh, and in that situation, when you've got a case where uh, even the plaintiffs may acknowledge weakness in the case, um, to uh, satisfy the plaintiffs uh, and the plaintiff's counsel and their demand for fees, uh, because of the ratio that uh, courts are imposing between the fees and the actual uh, relief provided to consumers, uh, that relief gets, uh, uh, you know, think of it as a factor of four times the attorney's fees that are paid up front. So um, if, if you hope to even get the, uh, the settlement approved. So for all of those reasons, it's very important to litigate these cases strategically, to time your defense motions uh, uh, appropriately, and to, and to address them that way. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions here, and uh, please uh, send in some more as well. 
Um, one is, uh, we, Angel had talked earlier about uh, how much information you disclose in response to a demand letter. Um, and uh, because there may be, you know, another cop on the beat, so to speak, uh, state attorney general, uh, the Federal uh, Trade Commission, which has some interest in some aspects of these cases, uh, or another plaintiff's firm. Um, and uh, also, you may be disclosing more about your defense theory. So, Angel, would you like to take sure. that Sure. And, and now, while you're de the response to a demand letter is to the particular plaintiff and plaintiff's firm who sent it, you cannot be assured that that is not going to be shared with others. In particular, one phenomenon that we have seen recently is uh, especially after David Bladick took over the Consumer Protection Division at the FTC, uh, is has been cooperation between uh, plaintiffs' firms and the FTC or the state AGs. Uh, and I've had a couple of clients experience that phenomenon, which is not a nice thing to experience. Uh, so uh, if you have any concern about that happening, uh, and you think that you know you're not really going to be able to settle the case, then our our recommendation is usually don't say very much in these responses to demands. In fact, I mean you don't even need to respond at all if you don't want to. The, the main purpose of of a response is if in the rare case that the case goes to a jury down the road that you could say, look, we we responded, we showed good faith, but. Um, I, you know, you need to think very carefully about that and where that where that information could go. Um, another question uh, then from one of our uh, participants here is uh, perhaps rhetorical, but how can a claim that a plaintiff would not have purchased a product but for a misleading ancillary claim like it's 100% natural, how can that claim ever be appropriate for class treatment? On help. Well. You know, unfortunately, the, the issue is, is the all-natural claim ancillary or not? Uh, and what that then gets into is what we talked about earlier when we were talking about class certification. Is there a persistent and material message? And is the claim that a product is all-natural material or not? What does that mean? And what you need to look at, especially now in light of Dukes versus Walmart, is uh, increasingly consumer survey evidence. So the, the good news is that the plaintiffs are going to have the burden to come forward with some survey evidence that actually shows that the, a claim like natural matters to consumers. On the other hand, look out, because your marketing people when they are coming up with their campaign to put natural on the packaging are going to have commissioned their own surveys that you're going to have internally and you're going to have a lot of powerpoint decks and so on that say natural sells more products so i mean that's the answer to that uh, i'm not saying that natural is always relevant I mean, there may be, you know, the word natural may be buried in some verbiage somewhere on the packaging, among many other benefits that are touted. That's where you want it, you know. But when the name of the whole line is so-and-so naturals, and it's in big print, and you've got internal documents showing that it matters, I, yeah, it can be relevant to class certification. Uh, there's another question now that goes to the issue of premiums. Um, one of the ways that plaintiffs have uh, attempted to withstand motions to dismiss early on in a case uh, is, uh, is either to allege the plaintiff would not have purchased the product but for the claim on the product. Um, and you can imagine courts uh, being uh, sympathetic sometimes to that line of reasoning if you think about claims like kosher which may not reflect anything about the intrinsic qualities of the product, but say something about its processing, or dolphin safe on tuna, for instance. Um, and so there is some case law that supports uh, uh, that theory. But then in addition, plaintiffs uh, have also started alleging that they paid a premium for the product 
uh, based on the particular labeling on the product. And maybe Angel, you could talk uh, about what have courts looked at uh, in the in the cases where there is a premium that's been alleged. Um, th this is one area where I would say the, uh, the, the merits uh, do overlap with class certification because, and, and to some extent standing, because here you're talking about uh, is it even possible for a plaintiff to show that they indeed paid a premium for the, uh, for the actual product um, there. So Angel, do you want to address that? Uh, actually, we had a we had a a slide up earlier when we were talking about summary judgment, which was the Snapple ruling in New York. You just passed it up right there, uh, Wiener versus Snapple. And uh, what? Let me start out by saying that very few courts have actually ruled on what the actual measure of damages is in these types of cases. There's a lot of broader case law, for example, under the California Consumer Protection uh, Laws, uh, the, the unfair competition law, that says that uh, you're only entitled to so-called restitutionary uh, disgorgement, if any disgorgement. And in turn, you have courts that have said restitutionary disgorgement means the difference between what you paid and the value that you received, okay? So this case, Wiener, which was not under the California Consumer Protection Laws, but similar analysis under New York law, basically held that the plaintiffs hadn't presented any evidence that they paid a premium for the all natural uh, representation. In other words, they didn't show that it had they bought some other tea that didn't say all natural, that would have cost them any less. So therefore, there wasn't any damage because you bought tea, you got tea. Uh, so there'd been a few rulings on that. Um, it is, I think, what the premium theory is all about, and the reason that the plaintiffs often allege the payment of a premium is because, in general, the courts have come to the common sense recognition that when you buy food, you're getting value for your money. You're getting food. You ate something, it was nutritious or whatever. Uh, so what, how exactly were you damaged by this false, allegedly false representation? I've seen very few courts take the position that n you wouldn't have bought the product at all and therefore you have to get all your money back. I mean, that's not something that judges have done. But keep in mind also that many of these cases have ultimately settled. So the ultimate question of damages is not one that has frequently been litigated all the way through. What you have seen in rare cases like Wiener versus Snapple, you get a ruling that says there's no evidence here. But what you've more often seen is suggestions by courts, some motions to dismiss where it's not yet ripe that you know there may not be enough here. And I in, hope that kind of answers the question. And, and in the issue of whether to go to the merits uh, before or simultaneously with class cert, um, this can be a productive uh, route of attack because you can uh, um, hire economists and marketing experts who can often look at the product and its competitors uh, in the space and make um, quite a plausible showing that indeed there was no premium paid for the claim uh, that's on the product. It's obviously difficult to analyze down to that level as to an individual claim on a product, but differences in packaging, differences in distribution channels, differences in um, the quality level of the product and other advertising and brand recognition that go along with the product um, really create uh, a lot of issues that make it difficult for plaintiffs to come forward uh, as they could not in the Snapple case um, and show that they have evidence uh, that would allow them to prove that theory. 
Um, this ties into another question that was asked about whether a preemptive motion for class certification is sometimes a good idea. Um, the, uh, the, the rule is that uh, in federal court, you can indeed, as a defendant, uh, force a motion for class cert by, in effect, moving that a class cannot be certified. And uh, that uh, often will take a, an unprepared plaintiff by surprise. Um, it is, to a great extent, a tactical um, uh, move uh, as opposed to one that, uh, that I think, uh, you know, ultimately leads to success. But it is a timing move, and it often uh, relates then to accelerating discovery and focusing it in on the issues that would be raised in that sort of a motion. Another uh, question that we have is, um, is about mediation in these sorts of cases and whether there's a value in mediating early, uh, perhaps with one individual plaintiff as opposed to an entire group of plaintiffs. Um, the, uh, I think mediation goes in the category of one of the takeaway points, which is focus on the merits of your case early on and whether there might be a way out of the case early, um, and mediation is, is often a useful way to flush out what the issues are in the case and to gain a better understanding of uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, it's also, uh, in our experience, been extremely helpful to use a mediator who typically is a retired federal judge, often in that locale, or uh, there are a few who have a more national reputation. Um, because uh, if, in fact, you do achieve a settlement, the fact that your mediator uh, was, uh, was someone who has sat on the bench before and who may know the other uh, judges that you're presenting this to uh, can be extremely persuasive to them that, indeed, this was an arm's length negotiation and that the relevant factors were considered, et cetera. Um, Angel, do you want to uh, talk about the benefits of uh, attempting to reach a settlement, for instance, with one set of plaintiff's lawyers as opposed to another. Many of these cases end up like a rugby scrum with a number of plaintiff's <laughs> lawyers jumping on, on the uh, defendant at the same time. Uh, and uh, there are, while that is not a great position to be in, uh, there are some advantages to it from a defense perspective. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, it's what sometimes has been referred to as a reverse auction. Uh, you know, who, who, who can you settle with for the lowest price? Um, you got to be careful with that, though, because when you have a bunch of competing plaintiffs' firms uh, and you reach a settlement only with one of them, uh, what that guarantees you is that you're going to have objectors to your settlement down the line and objectors who are informed and can come to the court and say, hey, you know, we have already, uh, you know, we've been looking at this case and this is not a good settlement for the following reasons. Now, uh, that said, you can't always avoid it because, you know, my, my general approach is to say to the with plaintiffs I am settling with, it's up to you guys, plaintiffs' counsel, to uh, make peace with your competitors and, you know, bring everybody under the big tent, as it were, uh, and they're not always able to do that. So, uh, and particularly in these days of increased court scrutiny of class action settlements, uh, you're going to get objectors no matter what. So, um, I, you know, it really depends on the case. In some cases, if you feel that you have a good settlement, that you've got plaintiff's lawyers who are going to stand up for it, and get it uh, preliminarily and finally approved, then you go with it, even though there's some others out there uh, who are not going to come in. And, and I might say, you know, some, some plaintiff's counsel are just not very reasonable. So if you can't settle with them, you know, so be it. So uh, our, if there are no more questions then, I think we'll wrap up. Um, I think we've responded to everyone's questions here so far. Um, we will uh, be circulating a link to the materials, uh, that the, the PowerPoint here. You all should have received the, uh, the PDF ebook uh, previously of the materials that we circulated in advance of this. That in includes our uh, food class action update. Uh, which we send out periodically on cases that have been filed and developments uh, in those cases. 
And if you'd like to be placed on that list, by all means, uh, please let us know and we'd be happy to circulate those uh, to you in the future as well. So thank you uh, very much for your participation in this. We hope that it's been useful. Uh, you have our contact information and uh, feel free to follow up uh, with, um, with any of us on uh, the various issues that we covered today. Uh, thanks again, and um, as they used to say on uh, Hill Street Blues, be careful out there. In these cases, plaintiffs often allege that they would not have purchased a product had they known that it contained a particular substance such as trans fat or lead or high fructose corn syrup. And the question is, will this be enough to state a claim if that substance in and of itself is not harmful in the product? Or will the court determine that the injury is too speculative? So in order to answer that question, let's step back and take a look at standing more generally. In federal court, plaintiffs must satisfy the requirements of Article III standing, which means that they must demonstrate a case or controversy between the parties. The key part of that is showing a concrete and particularized injury that the court can address. In addition, the plaintiff will also be required to satisfy the particular standing requirements of the state consumer protection law under which they sue. And the requirements of those, stat those statutes vary from state to state. However, some of the relevant questions under those statutes involve whether the plaintiff actually relied on the statement at issue, whether that reliance was reasonable, and whether the statement actually caused the plaintiff to purchase the product. And circling back to the initial question we began with, a key consideration when bringing a uh, motion to dismiss is whether the plaintiff actually suffered an injury and whether that injury is sufficient to confer standing. We'll take a look at a few cases that deal specifically with this issue. One of the key cases that demonstrates the types of theories of injuries that plaintiff allege is Enri Fruit Juice Marketing uh, Products Marketing, a case out of uh, Massachusetts Federal Court. In this case, the plaintiff challenged the advertising of fruit juices that contained levels at lead, of lead at which the FDA had already determined were safe for human consumption. And the plaintiff's theories were grounded on two particular uh, theories. The first was that the products posed a health risk because the plaintiffs were at future risk of harm from lead poisoning. The second was an economic injury alleged, and the uh, plaintiffs claimed that they would not have brought the products if they knew that they had contained lead. And these are two of the key theories that we're seeing uh, in these cases. Regarding the health risk, the court determined that that risk was too hypothetical and rejected it as a potential ground for standing. The court held that the plaintiffs failed to show a credible or substantial th threat to their health, uh, essentially importing a product liability standard, and determined that the plaintiffs had not alleged that there was a specific amount of lead actually in the product, the level at which lead would be dangerous, and they also could not demonstrate that anyone had suffered any actual injury, which was substantiated by the FDA's whole prior holding that the levels were, were in fact safe. As a result, the court concluded that not coincidentally, because there has, as Jack mentioned, also been an increase in general on health focused and, and other types of advertising of food. So uh, we've got a number of firms up on the screen um, and they've each, uh, each of them has been quite active uh, in the area. Uh, and, and you have firms that used to do things like antitrust class actions, asbestos litigation, insurance, even medical device litigation, and they're all moving uh, into food. That, by the way, the same is true of defense firms. You know, we're, we're going into the food area and have been for the past several years where we used to litigate in other areas. So we thought we'd take you through some uh, litigation strategies in these types of cases. When, if you get hit by one, how do you handle them? Uh, and at, at the risk of, uh, of giving away our ammunition to our plaintiff friends, uh, some of whom I guess are on the call, uh, let's talk about what you do, for example, when you get a pre-lawsuit demand. Uh, which is the typical in California, the Consumer Legal Remedies Act demand letter, uh, their equivalents in Florida and New Jersey and other states. Uh, do you want to, you know, put your defense case in your response? That's normally due within 30 days of receipt of the demand. Uh, you know, when you think about that, you really have to think about what 
you're going to do with the case. If you're thinking of settling the case, then it makes sense to put a pretty robust statement of your case in the letter that you send back to plaintiff's counsel. Uh, if you're thinking that you're actually going to litigate the case, that you have a pretty good chance of, of beating the case uh, on a pleadings motion, uh, then you might hold back and keep your powder dry. In doing it, you also need to consider, uh, as you're responding to these demands, the risk of, of uh, regulator lawsuits from uh, FTC, from state AGs, uh, and, and other uh, enforcers. So uh, should you settle before the litigation? It's always a question that comes up when you get these demand letters. Increasingly, we've seen plaintiffs' firms suggest that uh, a private settlement is the way to go. Uh, in, in, and that often becomes a case where the product sales are... It's corn syrup, even though the ingredient is listed on the product label. In other recent cases, plaintiffs have challenged overt marketing claims regarding specific health benefits. For example, vegetable spread that reduces cholesterol and milk with omega-3s that support brain health. These suits often allege that the manufacturer lacks sufficient clinical studies or other evidence to support the product claims. Other complaints in this area have challenged marketing claims that most would consider puffery, such as life-enhancing coconut water or a beverage with the ability to combat hangovers. Another common theme we've seen is plaintiffs challenging ingredient quality. For example, plaintiffs have challenged label claims of 100% pure Florida squeezed orange juice and 100% pure coconut water as allegedly misleading. In these cases, plaintiffs often claim that the claims are misleading in light of the processing that the product undergoes. And of course, one of the most talked about recent trends, all natural claims. In these cases, plaintiffs take issue with the use of the word natural to describe products containing allegedly unnatural ingredients including such common ingredients as baking powder and fruit extracts. In some instances, plaintiffs claim that processing renders an ingredient unnatural, such as alkalized cocoa or ingredients that are genetically engineered. One notable recent development in the all-natural complaints is the allegation that unnatural ingredients are somehow harmful. We've seen this allegation in suits over products with genetically engineered ingredients. Finally, we have suits alleging that products are misbranded under state and federal law, the number of these suits has grown significantly in recent months due to the work of one group of plaintiffs' lawyers who have filed suits against dozens of food companies. In these complaints, plaintiffs latch onto a purported violation of FDA regulations, often something highly technical, and proceed to attempt to transform it into a consumer protection claim. For example, these suits have challenged antioxidant claims, sugar-free claims, and other nutrient content claims. Now I'll pass it over to Angel to tell us who's behind this litigation. Thanks, Jack. Um, Who's behind the litigation? Well, a lot of firms that you've heard of in the past and some that you haven't heard of. I, what's tended to happen over the past few years is, I, I like to call it the uh, greener pastures syndrome. And in general, I would say that as uh, other areas of class action litigation have dried up, uh, either through uh, statutory uh, reforms or, or judicial decisions, for example, limitations on securities cases, uh, much more prone now to being dismissed on the pleadings. Uh, firms that were formerly in those areas have moved into the food area. Good morning, everyone. This is Trent Norris at Arnold and Porter San Francisco office, and I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar on uh, health-focused marketing and unappetizing litigation, latest trends in food labeling and advertising class actions. Uh, as most of you know, there has been uh, what some would consider a tidal wave of litigation uh, regarding uh, food products in the last couple of years. Um, literally dozens of cases have been filed uh, around the country in both state and federal court um, challenging a variety of claims made on food packaging. Uh, we wanted to update our uh, clients and participants uh, in today's webinar on the status of all of this litigation. Um, and uh, we thought that a WebEx would be the easiest way to do that. 
Um, there is a chat feature tool in WebEx uh, that some of you have used before. Please use that to ask questions throughout the program. We may have difficulty responding to all of your questions, but if your question is not answered, uh, by all means, please follow up with one of us. Um, the um, presentation should be appearing on your screen. If it's not, please press star zero and uh, the conference operator can assist you with that. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, there's an audio recording of it and it may be posted on our website and otherwise used, uh, so it may be available to the public. Uh, we will, of course, not, in t not uh, identify the requesters uh, of the questions. Um, and for your convenience, shortly after the program, we'll send a link with the presentation materials uh, to the participants today. Um, today's presenters are uh, myself, uh, my partner Angel Garganta, and our colleagues Rhonda Stewart-Goldstein and Jack Koenig. Angel and I have uh, presented a number of times on this very issue in the past, but today we actually have the brains of the operation with us uh, in the form of Rhonda and Jack uh, to talk about uh, more of the details. Uh, and get into it with you. Um, so without further ado, uh, Jack will first uh, uh, talk with us about what the plaintiffs are attacking in all of these cases. Jack? So as Trent said, to begin, we're going to take a look at the products and marketing claims that plaintiffs have been challenging lately. Um, as marketing has shifted to appeal to consumers' desire for healthier products, we've seen more and more plaintiffs filing suits over products that contain allegedly unhealthy ingredients. Most of these complaints cite product advertising that tends to suggest that the products are healthy or wholesome. Plaintiffs have claimed that such advertising is misleading on the grounds that the products contain some allegedly unhealthy ingredient, such as trans fat, saturated fat, or high fructose. They're not great, and the cost of litigation uh, might actually, in some cases, even approach the sales of the product. Uh, so you have to engage in, in a, a, a cost-benefit analysis think about whether uh, you know it makes sense to settle this case privately on a non-class basis with the particular plaintiff making the demand. Are you likely to be able to keep the settlement confidential? Are there other uh, plaintiffs out there uh, trolling, uh, no offense, uh, for the same kind of claims? Um, is this somehow going to get out? Uh, harm the reputation of your 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 company or your product, uh, and of course you you need to keep in mind that such a private settlement is not going to uh, give you race judicata effect is is not going to protect you from lawsuits by other plaintiffs. In doing all of this, naturally you need to consider uh, your chances of success uh, down the road. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Rhonda, who's going to take us through uh, precisely the kinds of things that you need to consider about uh, in, in terms of whether you're going to succeed down the road. Great. So assuming you haven't settled uh, prior, to the, prior to the complaint being filed, uh, the next question will be whether you want to move to dismiss the complaint or go ahead and file your answer. Uh, and a key consideration in determining whether you will move to dismiss depends in large part on the result that you think that you're likely to get. For example, if after evaluating the case, you think there's a good chance that the court will throw out the case entirely without granting the plaintiff leave to amend, then you likely will want to go ahead and file your motion. And if you think that you can narrow some of the claims or the theories that are alleged in the complaint, Similarly, you may also decide that it makes sense to move to dismiss. However, if the chances are good that the court will simply give the plaintiff leave to amend, you may not want to file the motion, as that will simply give the plaintiff an opportunity to fix the errors in the complaint and possibly weaken the potential arguments that you could have brought on class certification or at the summary judgment stage. So looking at the potential grounds upon which you could bring a motion to dismiss, one is the uh, a motion to challenge the plaintiff's standing or lack thereof. And a key question when thinking about standing is whether the plaintiff has sufficiently alleged an injury from a defendant's marketing of the product. 